land through which we have gone out as, as spies is the land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it were great men of great stature. And there we saw what? What did we see? We didn't see flowers, but we saw giants in the descendants of Anak from came from the giants and they were and it says that we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight my title and thought this morning is the immeasurable glory someone say the immeasurable glory let's pray pray for me I'm gonna pray for you father I pray God in the name of Jesus God that you would touch every heart every person in this place God that you'd open up hearts God open up minds God open up ears to what you want to say and what you want to do in this house God I pray from the top of my head God to the sole of my feet God I pray that the Holy Spirit God would manifest himself God in this place God I pray God that you move and speak God and change directions direction of our lives, God, and speak to us and speak through me in this place. God, hide me behind the cross that everyone looks into it. They would not see me, but they would see you and hear you high and lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. There was a story about a man who got a brand new metal detector. Does anybody have a metal detector in this place? Anybody? All right, we got a few. My son got one for Christmas, and he absolutely loves it, and he'll go around trying to find buried treasure, he thinks. And I'm like, son, there is no buried treasure in that backyard. So we'll go around and do some things. But there was this man that bought this new metal detector, and he took it out into a field to try it out for the first time. And as he turned it on, he got a really big, strong signal, and it started going off where he was standing. So he began to dug and immediately started digging, thinking, I found something absolutely huge. He could not find anything, so he picked it back up, went to the same spot, and it started going off again. And he said, what in the world is going on? It is so strong. So he began to dig a little bit more. And he ended up digging a 12-foot hole, but he, is not, he could not find anything whatsoever how about us if we were in this boat imagine how it would feel when he, when we and when he realized that the metal detector was detecting his steel toe boots on his feet the perception was the perception was that he had found something but the perception in our minds sometimes trick us into believing things that are not true someone say amen things people say about you or they'll say something about you or your family let me tell you something if you begin to listen to it long enough and you begin to speak to it long enough and start to speak it over your family you will become what you begin to speak if you want to be bitter then you keep being bitter if you want to be nasty in your life then all we got to do is just be negative and be nasty in our life but let me tell you something but if you speak purity and you speak the the word of God in your life there's going to be something on the inside of you that begins to turn I don't know about you but you are what you say you are you begin to believe it if you say it long enough then you start to believe it how many of you remember mom and dad or grandma and grandpa they would measure your height on the outside of the kitchen does anybody still do that they go to, you go to the kitchen door, and it's got all these little random marks. We'd move into our new house when we moved to Mobile, and we go in there, and I'm like, Lindsay, let's, let's go ahead and mark them. And she said, you ain't putting no marks on my door. You're not putting any marks on my door. And I'm like, baby, we got to keep up with their height. She said, we got paper. We've got a cell phone we could write that kind of stuff down. Like my mom, my mom and my grandma, last time I preached here, I talked about corded phones. Now I'm going back old school nowadays. I'm talking about measuring your height. And what mom and my grandma would do is they would mark us and they would put us all the way. But then as kids, we were so mischievous, we wouldn't stand flat-footed. We'd stand up on our tippy toes to make us a little bit higher than what we really were. Come on y'all I'm preaching right now and it's convicting somebody right now they're like yeah me 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 and so my mom would grab that black sharpie and she would mark it and then by the end of the year you would have so many different marks it wasn't just a black mark it was a black mark a red mark a blue mark a green mark an orange mark and it was so dysfunctional on that and I'm like what 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 is going on here anybody still do that anybody still do that like yep I know exactly where it is. We would mark, but I remember one time we got to mark uh, my height. And we got to, I, at a point, I felt like I stopped growing at like age 13. 
that, that's just me. I felt like I was tall for my age at age uh, 13, but then I just stopped growing. But then I remember one time I was on the basketball team, and I was the tallest guy on the basketball team. And then that time I, I was like, yeah, people are talking about how tall you are. And I'm like, yes, you know, this is making me feel so good. And then all of a sudden everybody started getting a lot taller than I was. And I was like, what in the world is going on here? And so what happened was is I would go back and measure myself in, on the door and I would get discouraged because I felt like I was not growing the way that I should be growing. I'm going somewhere with this. Then the next year I would go back and realize that I grew just a little bit. I grew more last year than I did the year before. And I was on the basketball team so it really hit my ego when I was a, when I was a lot younger. But I got to thinking about how God marks us and measures us. And if we can look back sometimes, sometimes we feel like we have not grown as much as we should, right? Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically. But I want to tell you something, and I want to get right into it. This is kind of my, Pastor David has taught me this. This is my introduction. I'm going to get 45 minutes later to my body, okay? I'm going to get there, all right? In Jesus' name, that's what he tells us. And what I got to tell us about is God does not measure us based on the outside appearance. I'm going somewhere right now. We have to determine our growth based on our roots and the depths of our roots. Let me say it like this. Your roots determine your fruit. Come on, y'all. Your roots determine your fruit. I haven't lived as long as much as uh, every, a lot of people in this place, but I can tell you one thing. Do not let somebody's outside deter you from the growth and the roots that are on the inside in your life. I know we got a lot of people in the church. Uh, we got a lot of people in this world that they tell you, you got to live, a, you got to look a certain way. You got to be a certain way in order to be successful, in order to make a lot of money. But let me tell you something. I'd rather rather my roots be so deep like an oak tree than to be like some little small tree standing when one small little wave comes by. I'm telling you, we're, we are going, I'm not getting too ahead of myself, but we are going to be a church on top of this mountain to where our roots go so down deep, so hard, and so long that no matter what comes our way, it's not going to hinder us. You know why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Someone shout amen. Man. It's like my pastor used to always say, there are too many people that are humble and they'll brag about how humble they are. Come on, y'all. They got to act a certain way. They got to look a certain way. They got to wear this certain clothes. They got to be a certain way. Let me tell you something. God cares about what is on the inside. That is why he chose David. Let me tell you something also is if you've got it, you don't have to flaunt it. Come on, y'all. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. When I get a Facebook message from Apostle so-and-so or Prophet so-and-so, I'm like, you don't have to have that name on your Facebook account to tell me who you are. Your lifestyle should show and prove to me what you are and who you are. Come on, y'all. And I'm like, if I've got it, I don't have to flaunt it. If I'm good, if I'm awesome, I don't have to flaunt it. And what, yo, 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 yippee, yay, you know what I'm talking about? You don't have to be like that. Be who God has called you to be. But the Israelites, flip the script for a moment. The Israelites thought so small of themselves that they compared themselves to what? A grasshopper. My children love hearing grasshoppers and they like to go catch them things, right? They like to go catch them. This is the mentality that I think that we need to break off of ourselves. I like to call it overcoming grasshopper mentality. I like to overcome grasshopper mentality. Now, we're going to go to school for just a moment, and I'm going to teach you something. This mentality is what breaks people. The grasshopper mentality is what breaks people. It doesn't make people. It actually breaks people. The Israelites were in Egypt, and they loved Egypt. In the moment they got out, they began to think, well, I was better over there. I don't know about you, but when God does something so significant and, and so supernatural in your life and he delivers you from something, sometimes we go back and we're like, I was happier over there. What am I supposed to do? Well, as long as you stay over here, that's as great as you're ever going to be. But the moment you step out in faith, that's the least you're ever going to be. Come on, come on, y'all. Y'all going to have to help me preach this morning. 
It's like talking about a tithe. You take this money, and I'm going to put it back. I promise you, you are watching me right now. I'm going to take this tithe dollar right here that a, that a gentleman put in here. I'm going to take $20, and this is what I'm going to get. This is what I got this week, right? This is what I got this week. This is what my job paid me. If you keep that money or that gift inside of your hand, that is the greatest that that money is ever going to be. But the moment that you place my God in heaven, the moment that you place it into God, that is the least that it's ever going to be. It's the moment that you place your gift, the moment that you place your faith, the moment that you place your calling in God, the moment that you place whatever it is in God, you are giving it to an immeasurable God because he says, I don't measure like we do. I don't measure like you do. I've got I can do guess what exceedingly and abundantly above all that I could ask or think I don't know who I'm talking to this morning but God is fixing to do something in our life and in, in this church and in this community that we have never experienced and seen before come on and seal it with a shout of praise grasshoppers I don't know if you know this but grasshoppers rub their legs together to make the chirping noises it don't come from their mouth that's something different for me. I don't know. I don't, it's like, did you just study a grasshopper? Yes, I, I graduated from Lee University with a degree in grasshopper theology, okay? Just kidding. They rub their legs together to make chirping sounds. One interesting fact is that they also, I'm giving y'all a lesson here, they have ears on their bellies so that it allows them to feel and hear the vibrations of other animals that are coming to try and harm them. It feel, they feel the vibration. As a result, they respond to the chirps and other animals. Uh, uh, make, they, the way they communicate, they respond to the way that they communicate with each other by the ears on their belly. Now, I'm going to tell you what. God is a very interesting God to put, some, uh, put an ear on a belly, y'all. I don't know if you think that, but he does. Grasshoppers also have the ability to jump away from any kind of predator. In fact, if we humans could jump like that, we could jump the length of a football field, and they can also fly. I don't know about you, but I don't have the kind of calf muscles or leg muscles to jump five yards. Y'all, come on, somebody help me right now. We, if we were like that, we'd be able to jump across the length of a football field. Grasshoppers also... I feel like I'm about to preach to somebody. Grasshoppers can eat half of their body weight in a day, okay? Not me. I cannot eat half my body weight in a day. Now, if it's steak or taters or something, I can do that, y'all. We can do that. We can hear more about, lo we hear more about locusts and bi uh, causing billions of dollars in damages to crops. Locusts and grasshoppers, I'm getting somewhere, y'all going to have to stay with me. Locusts and grasshoppers are in the same insect order, and they devour fields, and even we see evidence of this in the Bible in the plagues, right? So grasshoppers are very um, interesting characters. While they are able to do all of those amazing things, there is one thing they cannot do. They do not have the ability to think. They do not have the ability to think positive or think in any kind of aspect in any kind of way. Have you ever noticed that these, these men, the spies in Numbers chapter 13, they began to hear the report and began to make sounds. And, and that negative sound, they, uh, Moses sent out how many spies? He sent out 12 spies. Ten of them came back with a negative report, and only two of them came back with a positive report. I'm here to tell you something it matters what you speak it matters what you do these men heard a report and began to make chirping sounds that not a lot of people thought positive about the chirping started going around the people how about that? How many, how many of you know that that happens? There's a little bit of a chirp here in this community, and then that negativity will go to another community, right? How about we start getting to a place? Well, we. this is the thing. This is the reoccurring theme, I think, with the church in general, is that people, they know God, but they don't know God. 
They know of God, but they don't know God. There is a difference of knowing God and knowing of God. Well, I'd rather go play golf or I'd rather go work on a Sunday. I'm telling you what, if you got to provide for your family, we support you. But let me tell you something. I've never seen a blessed and a righteous person ever not work hard for the kingdom of God or work hard for their family. I'm telling you, I'm t- there, is, there is something that God is fixing to do in our lives and if we will just commit ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his church God's going to do something that we have never ever seen before but here's the thing from the beginning of time is that God gave us the ability to for free will right he gave us the ability to choose what we do and what we don't do well guess what I've already chose for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord I don't know about you I've already chose for this church in this day standing on the shoulders of those before me as for me and this house we will serve the Lord here is something else I noticed they thought, they, they said they thought what they thought they could look like. They, they knew that they were grasshoppers, right? They were like, oh, well, I'm, I'm just a grasshoppers. And then they said, we know what we look like. Well, you're identifying yourself as a negative, what you're doing. Okay, fast forward. What does the giant say about you? The giant says that you are a, a grasshopper as well. This is what Scripture says. It says, we think that about us. They think that about us. But no one in this scripture has consulted the God in heaven about what he thinks about them. They may think they're grasshoppers. Let me get in your terms for a moment. You think you're small and mighty. But God called a man named Gideon to be one of the greatest men of God. He might have been three and a half foot tall, but he had a Goliath spirit on the inside of him. And there was something on the inside of him, someone on the inside of him that was fixing to blow up in inside of his life if you would just consult God this is the thing stop asking yourself what you think and ask God about what he thinks about you well God what do you want to do I'm getting somewhere God what do you want to do in my life here's the thing God does not measure the same way that we measure y'all God does not measure the same way that we measure God measures one day by 10,000 God measures 10,000 by one. Everything is different. But the moment that you were born, the doctor gave you what? A height and a weight, right? When my children were born, it about killed my wife. It, they were like nine and an eight pounds. They were huge. They were, absolute, they were like Goliaths, okay? They were just huge. Cason was absolutely abnormal. Eden was abnormal. They all were, I felt like, except for little bitty Andy, little precious girl, okay? And whenever you come out the womb, the doctor says, this is what they weigh. You don't ask. Now, some of you might, but people don't usually ask, well, what color hair do they have? Do they have six fingers on one hand or do they have six toes on the other? Which one do they do? Okay. You ask, how big were they? So you're measured by your height through your weight. So measurements are something, and I am getting somewhere. Y'all going to have to hang on. I'm I'm stirring the pot just a little bit. But whether you believe it or not, We live by measurements every single day of our lives. Don't believe me? How much how much medicine do I give my child? Anybody? We'll get that little bitty cup. Just if it's at like 7:30 at night, just go ahead and fill it to the brim of Benadryl. Just give it to them. They will be fine. Okay? Unless you're like my child and it does the opposite reverse and they get hyper. They don't go to sleep, right? How much gas do I put in my car? Y'all? Come on, it's a measurement. How much money do I need to save this week? Well, if we're going on vacation, then you need to probably save $85,000 because your wife and your kids are fixing to blow your wallet, okay? They're fixing to. How much money do I need to save this week? How much milk do we have left in the fridge? I don't know about you, but we go through milk like crazy, right? What about did that football team make that first and I'm preaching to Ider and North Sand Mountain folk up in this place right now. I'm just kind of I ain't gonna get in your grill. I promise I'm not. But did that football team really make that first down? And you go on that TV and it's got this much away from the first down. And you're like, oh, it's a first down. That's a first down. And I'm like, 
y'all are blind as a bat, y'all. Come on. You know it. And that is te- that shows me how loyal your, your fan base really is to your community. It's like they could be 50, they could be five feet away from the first down, and you're like, oh, it's still a first down. Well, that just tells me how faithful and loyal you really are. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, even when we, as a fan, even though they make a wrong call, you may agree with that call, but on the outside, you're like, that's a wrong call, ref. Come on up. That's a wrong call. And the list goes on and on and on. But at the end of the day, God does not measure the way that we measure. But in our scripture this morning, God has told the people of God that they have stayed at this mountain long enough. And they are to go possess a new land. So the people of God were walking around a certain mountain so many times. And God says, stop doing what you're doing and go do something different. I've given you a land. Well, God, you've given me this mountain. Yeah, he's, it's not a this or a that. It's a both. Come on, y'all. It's not just, why are we leaving this mountain? It's a, we are not leaving this mountain. This mountain is still ours. But God is giving us a new land because God eventually doesn't want us just to stay in this mountain. I'm not speaking to about this mountain. I'm speaking to the Deuteronomy. Y'all got to follow with me in the, right now. They're talking about that mountain. You've possessed that mountain long enough. Now go into new territory and new land and possess it because guess what? God's fixing to enlarge the territory. I don't know about you, but God just told me to tell you that God's fixing to enlarge some territory at Fairview Church of God this morning. I believe that God's about to do something different in this house. I believe in people to say, you know what? Pastor O.A., he did amazing things. Yes, he did. Pastor Keith, he did amazing things. But guess what? I'm standing on the shoulders of the men of God and the women of God that came, my wife and I and our children. We're going to stand up together. You know why? Because this is not just a one thing, one time thing. This is eternity. And I believe, I'm not getting ahead of myself, but I believe that are people in heaven that are cheering us on saying, come on, you can do it. You got it. Come on, Fairview. Come on, Fairview. You got it it but they possess this this mountain for far too long and they've got to go possess a new land but here's what Moses did next Moses sent spies into the land to spy out the land and God told him send out 12 spies they all came back 10 of them came with a negative report but two of them came with a positive report now let me just back up just a little bit and tell you something You don't remember the names of the ten people that were negative. You remember the ones, the two that stuck out. You know what their names were? It was Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. Joshua ended up becoming the next great leader of Israel. And Caleb, in his old age, said, give me that mountain. That's the mountain I want. I don't know about you, but how you respond what is in front of you, how you face what is in front of you is how people will remember you. It's not about how you responded yesterday in the good days, but it's how we respond in the valley moments of our life about how people are going to remember you. Note... We don't remember their names, but Caleb and Joshua, we do. But we cannot, I want to make this very clear, we cannot go where God wants us to go as long as we have limitations in our life. We cannot do what God has called us to do as long as we have limitations. Limitations on two things. Limitations on ourselves. We are like grasshoppers in our own sight. There's got to be a point in our time, y'all, to where we just get in our car. We got to go for a drive. We got to go pump gas. We got to walk through a Dollar General store. We got to get wherever we got to do to get away. And we got to get right side in our mind. And I don't know why I'm telling this this morning, but I feel like telling somebody, you got to take authority over what you're speaking over your life and even your kids. Listen to me, y'all. I'm not the most perfect person. You're like, man, we are so glad you're here. I am so thankful I'm here. But y'all, can I give you an honest opinion? I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know. I don't know. That's why I've got people around me that are surrounding us. And you know what? At the beginning of this year, we're gonna, God spoke to me and said, I want you to seek me with all your heart, and I want you to lead with me with all your heart because we're fixing to do something amazing. But the thing is, in Jesus' name, what I, what I think that we are doing in our lives is that we are placing limitations on ourselves, but we are also placing limitations on God. You see, the problem is not us. 
Come on, y'all. The problem is not us. The problem is our view of God. The problem is how we view God and how big we view God. God is not some little jelly bean sitting on the side saying, well, go do what you want to do. Guess what? God's not some God that came into earth and created everything to leave us. He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. I'm sending a comforter for you. We cannot place limitations on us or God. But here's the thing. We cannot measure our God to our giants. We have to measure our giants to our God. We got to go up to ourselves and we got to say, you know what? You know what, God? I'm going to measure my circumstance and my situation up to you. Because for far too long, we've told God about our situations. I'm telling you, y'all, I, I believe that God cares about us. God cares a lot about us. He cares about what we go through. But we cannot tell God about our search situations. We've got to tell our circumstances and situations about God. Come on, y'all. Whenever we tell uh, that situation or circumstance about God, God does something greater in our life. And I believe that whenever we explain what we are going through in the family situations, I don't know who I'm talking to this morning. You may have walked in here heavy burden. You may have walked into this place, and you don't know why you're here. And you're like, I just strolled in here. Guess what? It's a death destiny moment between you and God. God wants to touch your life. God wants to touch your family. God wants to do something in your, in your family, in your life that he has never done before. But guess what? You've got to take your situation and you've got to measure it to God. And you're going to say, situation, devil, let's get more specific. Devil, you will bow to God today. You're, you're going to get your hand off my family. You're going to get your hand off my kids. You're going to get your hand off this church. You're going to get your hand off of my life. Because you know why? Because we are taking the limitations off. And when you do that, you'll soon realize that there's no devil in hell that's going to stop you from fulfilling God's plan of your life. How about you ask a man in a wheelchair to climb through uh, three flights of stairs, and he will say to you, I can't do that. Ask a lady without eyesight to walk through your house, and she will say, I can't do that, Pastor. Ask a teenage boy who is paralyzed or, or born uh, with difficulty in his legs to play football. He will say, Pastor, I can't do that. Or ask a teenage girl that's unable to hear or to listen to your CD collection. She will say probably, Pastor, I can't do that. But ask your God to do the impossible. And he says, I can do that. Fair of you, church. Church of God. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, but it's time to take the limitations off and get ready for what God is fixing to do in our lives. Someone say amen. Brother Casey, y'all come up and get ready. I don't know what it is that's limiting you in your life. I don't know what it is that's causing you to go back instead of forward. And if I can be honest with you, we all go through a lot of things in our life. There's a lot of things that we go through, we walk through, and if you live as long as a lot of us have in this place, you'll begin to realize that there is a devil that is real. But on the flip side of that, you'll begin to realize that there is a God in heaven that still sits on his throne, y'all. And he is not going to leave us, and he's not going to forsake us. You see, because limits are boundaries to keep us in a certain area, right? limits keep us in a certain area when my kids get a little wild you put them in the you put them in the uh, their room and you close the door that limits them to that room right when my little girl we had a crib for she just moved she just graduated into a big girl bed right and she is doing absolutely fantastic it's a huge answer to prayer it's absolutely amazing because she's, if you know Eden, she's very, very rambunctious she's like up down up down up down I'm gonna hang from the chandelier okay that's what I'm gonna do but when we moved her from that, it had no guardrails on the side. Well, just one side it does. But she's able to get up, move around, walk around, get up, slide off, and walk around. But when she was in that crib, she had walls all the way around her. She had limitations around her that made her stay where she is. I don't know who I'm talking to in this place, but the anointing of God is so strong right now. I feel him so strong right now 
There are limitations that you yourself have placed yourself in. You and your family. And you say, God, I cannot do this. And God says, yes, you can if you'll just take the limitations off of your life. See, we would put my kids in the playpen and it would confine them to where they were. They weren't able to get up and to move around. They were limited. They were limited to the point or the edge or line to where they could not cross. I believe that the mountain in Deuteronomy that we're talking about here, that God spoke and said, you've, taught, you've done this mountain long enough, go possess a new land. I believe that mountain was their limitation. Yeah. I believe that there was a greater territory. I believe that there was a greater mountain that they were supposed to stay at, that they were supposed to go to, because as long as they stayed at that mountain, that's the greatest they would ever be. But the moment that they left the mountain, and the moment that they stepped out in faith, and they possessed a new land, that's the least that they would ever be. You see, because the Israelites went into a, they came out of a place called Egypt. And they were going into a promised land. And they were so they were satisfied in their life. I don't know about you, but I think sometimes as Christians, we get it and we get over it really quick. We get a move of God and we get over it really quick. But I'm telling you, the new land and the new places that we want to go, that God wants to take us, God wants to do something greater and bigger in this world if we will just submit ourselves to him and say, God, I will do whatever you want us to do. I will do whatever you want me to do. Take every wall out. See what it is. See what it is is you say, well, pastor, what is it that's personally, mentally, emotionally, physically keeping me or keeping our church from doing what God has called us to do. That's easy. Limitations. It's the limitations that you have put in your life. Well, I can't be the father and the mother that I should be, Pastor Stewart. I had a poor example growing up. I've been hurt by the church so bad. This is true. But you are limiting yourself based off of a past circumstance. And God doesn't want you to live on that mountain and to die on that mountain anymore. God wants you to move past that mountain. Because here's the thing. If you've not heard one thing this morning that I've said, I want you to hear this. God does not measure us based off of our past. But he measures us based on what he did at Calvary. And through the blood of Jesus Christ. We, don't, we are not measured. People say, well, I know what you did, Pastor. I know what fair of you did. I know what you used to do. But guess what? I know, I know, I know, I know that we are all sinners and we are all saved by grace. I know it. But here's the thing. The moment that you give your life to Jesus and the blood of Jesus covers you, you are no longer that person anymore. You are no longer that old stinky thing anymore because God has called you brand new. How is it that blood could cleanse me? I don't know. Let's go to Calvary and let's ask Jesus about what he did. I believe that what Jesus did on the cross was not just for a moment, but it was for eternity. And the blood shed that he had, the blood that he shed over our house, I believe the blood that he has shed over this church, the blood that he has shed over these families, it's more about the limitations, breaking off the limitations in our life and say through the blood of Jesus I can do anything because with him anything is possible look at your neighbor and say bound by limits bound by limits here's the first measuring stick and I, this is my first of many 18 closings here's the first measuring stick that we've got and if we can be honest with each other we all have some kind of measuring stick in our life to where we're measuring ourselves to other people. We're measuring ourselves to other people. Here's the thing. God's not called you to be me. God's not called me to be you. Let's just be each other. How about we do that? God's not called me to be another Stephen Furtick. God's not called me to be a Pastor David Smith. God's called me to be Pastor Stuart Wilkerson. That's the best I know how to be. And that's exactly what I'm going to be. But I want you to look at the story in Matthew chapter 14 where Jesus has fed the 5,000. And to the natural eye, it was just a little boy's box of lunch. It was just that. But to the supernatural eye, it was a miracle feast. And then the disciples looked at it and said, 5,000, 5,000. 
and five loaves of, of bread, right? And two fish, right? That, that just, that doesn't add up to me. Because God does not measure the way that we measure. Even the disciples doubted the measuring process. I can imagine the disciples taking that measuring stick. And they would go up and they would say, you know what? That food really isn't, uh, that's not a big enough sub sandwich for all these kind of people. I don't really know what we're going to do. I don't know who I'm talking to today. But God's name doesn't mean just enough. It means more than enough. It means that he's going to do greater. He's going to do exceedingly and abundantly. That's the first measuring stick that we have over our lives. The disciples even doubted the process. They saw 5,000. They saw the food. It's not going to measure up. It's not going to amount to anything. It's not going to work. Pastor Stewart, it's not going to work. Measuring stick number two, we go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we flip the story to, to King David. The prophet Samuel. Whew, I love this story. I absolutely love this story. The prophet Samuel walks in and says, Give me the best looking boy. Give me the most talented boy out of the entire bunch. And that's who's going to become king. I imagine that man of God walks in. And, and, and Samuel starts measuring and saying, This is him. This is the next king because you know why? We had a Saul before. Saul was tall, dark, and handsome, and he had a lot of money. He had it all put together. But guess what? The people of God wanted that measuring, but God said, I've called a little boy named David. So he goes down the list of line, and he goes down the, the list, and he says, this is going to be the captain of the varsity football team. This is going to be him. And they walk around, and he says, this is going to be him. Nope, not him. God, I can imagine Samuel saying, are you serious, God? You're telling me that this is not him. Yep, I'm right. Isn't that crazy that, that we like to question God about what he's doing and what he wants to do? And we wonder why the consequences are so bad? Come on, y'all. And we go down the line and we say, well, this is the person. This is the person. This is the person that we need to be. And it goes all the way down the line. And then Samuel says, is there not another one? And Jesse says, oh, that little boy of mine out there called David, he's out there tending to my sheep and shepherding my people. Samuel says, go get him. And I can imagine Samuel seeing this little boy walking with a limp, this little no good preacher boy who God has called that nobody recognized as, as a king just yet because of his physical stature. And he looked upon him and he said, you know what? This, this is the king the next king and he measures them and he says this is who God wants it to be I don't know about you but God does not look on the outward appearance God looks at the heart even though David might have been small in stature like Gideon he had the heart of a giant and that is exactly why God called him God called him because he had a heart like him he had a heart for him you fast forward here's measuring sick number three and this is where we get real personal Fairview Church of God Fairview Church of God, I believe that we the people, I believe that there's been a limitation for the past several months over this church. I believe that there's been a limitation that people over the last few months, people have said, oh, that, 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 it's a church that they're, they're not going to measure up to anything. They're just not going to measure up to anything. I'm speaking to you, God. I'm speaking to me right now. Because a lot of times what other people are saying dictate what we do and how we do things so not only did we measure the 5,000 or did we measure the uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16 with the anointing of King David but let's measure ourselves for just a moment I believe I believe if you can imagine in the spirit realm I believe that there's a big measuring stick that the devil is holding over this house this morning and he's saying the church will never measure up to anything it will do no good in this community these are things that the devil has spoken over us has spoken to me but I believe Believe that it's time for us. I want you to mark it down right now by the authority of Jesus Christ right now standing in this pulpit. I believe if you haven't heard one thing this morning, I want you to remember that this day the Lord has revealed and told to us as a church family that this morning on February 13th to break the measuring sticks off of our lives and off of this church. 
because guess what? He's fixing to do something that he has never, ever done before. I believe I believe, y'all, that there's not enough pews. There are not enough pews that's going to fill the people that are coming into this fair view. I believe, I believe, I believe that there's not enough measuring sticks in this place that's going to measure the spirituality and the depth of what God's going to do in our life. I believe in Jesus' name that there's a stage not big enough that's going to house the musicians and the singers to come into our community. I believe, I believe that there's not a measuring stick big enough to measure the Sunday school teachers and the small group leaders that are fixing to come into this community. I believe. I believe in Jesus' name. My goodness, Casey, you bought me a bunch of them. I told you to, and guess what? We did it. I believe. I believe. Hold on, my shiata, my kuri, I I believe that there's not a measuring stick big enough to measure the kids that are coming from the community into this church. I believe in Jesus' name. I believe. I believe in Jesus' name. Oh, God. Well, guess what? Pastor Jaron, I'm going to speak right now to all of us in the student ministry right now. I believe well, you only took 12 to Winterfest. Well, guess what? Shut your mouth, devil, because that 12 is going to rip your neck in half. I've stood. I've stood in the places before where they have been. I'm, I may be speaking prophetically, but there is a generation that's out in this mountain that is loose and not saved and not going anywhere. I believe that there is a ruler that's fixing to be broken and a generation is about to fill that sanctuary. I believe that kids' church is not big enough. Madison, I didn't mean to hit your foot. I'm sorry, sister. I believe that the, youth, that the student center is not big enough to what God is fixing to do in our youth group. Pastor Jerry and Miss Lacey, y'all better get ready. Buddy, if you can hear me, you watch this later on your iPhone, whatever. I don't know, but you better get ready. Kids church. And guess what? God is fixing to send workers. God is fixing to send volunteers to where it used to be one person leading it. It's going to be one person leading the group, but workers all up under. I believe that God is sending workers to fill the harvest in Jesus' name. I believe that God's fixing to do something greater. This day, this day, this day, mark it down, says God, I'm breaking every measuring stick over your life. God is wanting to break the measuring sticks off of our lives and off of this church. Because Fairview Church of God, we better fast, we better pray, we better seek. Because what God is doing is much bigger than us. And God is fixing to turn Sand Mountain upside right. And God is fixing to send a new wave of revival. God's fixing to send a glory to fill this mountain. God is fixing to send a generation of people that's, that is hungry for the presence of God. If you believe it, give him a shout of praise all over the house. Let me be honest with you for just another moment. Keep standing if you want to, if you're able. Stay right here with me. In the church of God, we are a church of God denomination, aren't we? We are licensed, affiliated with the church of God. We believe in it. We believe in the teachings. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus died and three days later rose again. We believe it. But here's the thing. This is the thing that I don't see anymore. 
I don't see ministers anymore coming out of churches anymore. I see just a few, but I don't see them coming out of droves like they used to. This is what the Lord spoke to me. Miss Evelyn, You may. I want you to speak it into existence, and I want you to pray for us. But I believe when Pastor O.A. and Miss Evelyn were still pastoring this church, all I heard about Fairview was that there was a wave of ministers that came out of this place. You had a Pastor David Smith. You had a Pastor Heath, a Pastor Ray. Andy, the, the Varnells, you had so many different people coming out. I don't know about you, but I want a new wave of ministers coming out of this youth group. I want another wave of ministers coming out of this church. Because guess what? The church of God is limited. But God said this day, I'm breaking every limitation off of this church in Jesus' name. Come on, give him a shout of praise. This church, your family, will never measure up to anything. Devil, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You are under my feet, the shed blood of Jesus over our life right now. Come on, let's plead the blood of Jesus. Come on, let's plead the blood of Jesus. You are under my feet. Devil, you have spoken for far too long. But God, you be glorified in this house. Because here's the thing. The Bible says, oh God in heaven, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every weight that hinders us and sin that easily ensnares us and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out before us. Let our eyes be fixed on Jesus who the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy set before him what did he do? He endured the cross. He scorned the shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sin man so that you will not grow weary and lose heart I don't know about you I don't know about you people of God you're tired you're weary this church this staff this council has carried this church for months without a shepherd you should be proud you should be very proud that this church has existed and done what they can because guess what it's not all up to me it's up to me, the Lord, and all of us together to accomplish what we're doing. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, y'all. Brother Dwight, I can imagine when we get tired and when we get weary, I can imagine this scripture. Imagine you being on a football field. Brother Owen and Miss Rita, I hear it all the time. We're going to see our grandson play football. We're going to go see him play football. Like they are. And many of you in this place support your grandchildren, your kids. I can imagine this race that we're running. And we're saying, God, it's fourth and one, and I'm tired. And God, I can't make it. I can't do it. But you look upon those stands, and you see Pastor Oway saying, you got it. You can do it. You can do it. Oh, my God. I, I can see my grandmother, my great-grandmother. I'd come home from church when I was a younger kid. I'd come home from that little Baptist church, and she'd be sitting there in her recliner, and she'd be making soap. She loved to make soap, and she'd give it to me. And I thought that was the craziest thing, but thank God for it. And I would sit there, and she'd say, Son, tell me about what you learned today. And, she, and if I didn't know, she'd say, Good, because I listened to your service, and I'm going to tell you exactly what, what was said. And she would sit there and talk to me. I could imagine times where I would get weary. I would look upon the stands, and I can see my great-grandmother, Geraldine Cross, sitting on the stand saying, Stuart, you got it, baby. You got it. I could see Lindsay's grandfather, who was pastor of Fort Payne for many years, and he would travel around Donald Bradley. He would look upon us right now he would look upon this church and he would look upon Rick and Gina Bradley and he'd say babies I know you're tired I know you're, I know you're weak and I know you're weeping and I know but guess what weeping endures for, for just a moment but joy is coming in the morning and I can imagine them saying you can do it in Jesus name you can do it in Jesus name I believe that 
what God is doing, and I'm done. I believe that what God is doing in this church is going to be greater. And if you will just keep your eyes on Jesus and you will look upon the stands, you will realize there will always be more for you than there is against you in Jesus' name. Come on, stand up with me all over the house if you're able to. If not, you can stay seated. It's okay. I don't know who it is in this house. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. I feel such a sweeping of glory in this place. The immeasurable glory. I believe that there's an immeasurable glory. I don't know about you, but I want a triple fold anointing of what God's fixing to do in this place. I want a triple, I want a quadruple. If you're in this place and you're saying, Pastor Stewart, I have doubted myself for such a long time. This church, I've, I've doubted everything around me, but this church has never left me. They've loved me. And you're saying, I want to break the limitations off of my life. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand quietly right now. Everyone looking around. No one looking around. Okay, there we go. We got a few. We got a few. Oh, God. People of God, I want you to begin to pray. I want you to begin to pray. Saints of God, I want you to begin to pray right now in Jesus' name. Because what God's fixing to do is bigger than us. He's fixing to move. He's fixing to do something. If you raise your hand, I want you to come down to this altar right now. Come on. Nobody being embarrassed. If you if you don't want to be embarrassed, that's okay. Come on. There are people all over this place that feel limited. They feel limited. I don't know about you. If you're in this place and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if that's you, I want you to come down here and meet me right now. And you're like, Pastor Stewart, I am not where I need to be. If that's you, I want you to come down here real quick. And we're going to pray. We're going to have altar. We'll stay here as long as we can. Come on, Pastor Casey, y'all go ahead. Y'all begin to lead us, y'all. Come on.